Hi, I'm Owen from REST Australia. Thanks for tuning in to the REST Network. Before we get into today's show, there are a few things we have to go over. Firstly, what you're about to hear and see is limited to general information only. It's not personal financial advice like you'd get from a financial planner. Also, it's important to remember that past performance is not indicative of future performance. That means that anything that's happened in the past, or we say today, is not necessarily going to reflect what happens in the future. Lastly, please consider that any of the guests or myself are featuring on this program may have a financial interest in some of the products or shares mentioned. That's enough from me. I hope you enjoyed today's program. Charlie, how you going, mate? I'm well, Owen, and thankful for you for getting me out of about 40 minutes of homeschooling, so thanks. <laughs> yeah, you just said week eight of lockdown for you, huh? Yeah, I think it is. I mean, honestly, you lose count of it, but you do what you have to do. It's in everyone adjusts and, you know, it's not that great a hardship for the, for the greater good. So thankfully, I have a business that can adjust to working from home and you've got to be a little bit thankful for that considering the, you know, the impact on a lot of other people. Yeah, for sure. I, um, I think the same, you know, every day I'm thinking, well, I can still work. And in fact, to be honest, sometimes being in this industry, at least in doing podcasts, which is one day of the week for me, um, more people have time to listen. So they tend to, which is good for business. So I, I, I count my blessings twice over there. Um, mate, we've spoken in the past and the last time we spoke, I was in Sydney. It was very early days for this podcast series. A lot has changed in this time, but also on your end, a lot has changed, um, which we'll get to in just a minute. But I think I may have asked you this at the time, the transition from you know, broker to fund manager and that type of thing uh, and the, the kind of lessons learned there. But maybe now that we're a few years in, what have been some of the big lessons that you've learned running your own fund and dealing with clients of a different ilk, um, managing a team, doing all those types of things? What are some of the big things that come to your mind? Well, I mean, the greatest lessons actually came from my father, who I mentioned in the, the last podcast, but he actually passed away in March. And oh, sorry, I had one last trip. No, it's okay. He had a full and happy life. But I had one last trip away with him in the country. It just happened to be a fluke about a week before he died. He wasn't sick or anything. And we had a long drive through the country of New South Wales, seeing some friends. And we just had discussions about investing and looking after people's money. Remember, Dad was the chief executive of Perpetual and the chief and started the industrial share fund. So he's pretty well versed in investments. Mm -hmm. And he just reminded me that you, you, the main lesson is you, you are looking after other people's hard earned money. Never forget that. It's not a game. It's, it's not, it's real. They've worked very hard to get that money and don't lose it for them and treat it like it's your own. And Dad, Dad was always very much of the view that the more you could simplify things and follow a process and good, get good people around you and repeat that process and just own good businesses, it'll probably be okay. And thankfully, over the last couple of years, those lessons in just mm -hmm. simple investing, keep it to what you know, surround yourself with good people, don't be trying to be an, you know, an expert on everything, has actually stood the fund and the returns uh, uh, very well. But as you know, I mean, nothing's an easy transition. Like, I mean, <laughs> from broking to fund manager, let alone throw in a pandemic, throw in you know, things that no one ever thought thought could happen. And here we are. But it's, a, I still thoroughly enjoy it. But most of it's about, you know, putting a few runs on the board and actually getting really good people around you. It makes it a lot easier. Mm. Yeah, I think that um, that resonates. Um, you average, average of the five people closest to you, they say. So... How about then, um, that's actually interesting because I noticed the team, you know, the team's pretty strong. Um, how, one thing I always like to ask is, how have you gone about building a team of analysts and investors around you to support that? Um, and I guess just from a high level, just to kick things off, how have you built that team and, and built kind of your, your, your lineup, if you like, your players in the, well, I think in the squad? Yeah. One thing to first of all acknowledge is that we all have a lot of weaknesses and there's a lot of smart people out there and there's a lot of people who can really add to a process. My main approach was to get smarter and younger people with diverse experience around me. And it's obviously not hard at 48 and being me to find smarter and younger people. That was, <laughs> that was not the hardest bit. But, but it's finding people with those sort of quiet professionals who love investing, probably have some sort of accounting or finance background, and are really driven and really want to quietly go about their business professionally, but also challenge me. As a chief investment officer, I need to be challenged on the decisions we take and I need to be challenged myself. So you don't need a, a group of yes men and women. You need a, a group of sort of people who are prepared to question you and stand up for the work they've done themselves. So 
I've been mm-hmm. lucky enough to have people find us. I've had, you know, young guy, a young guy who came out of credit at Merrill Lynch, which is a completely, you know, sector I know nothing really about credit. And I've had two wonderful um, uh, research analysts slash portfolio managers emigrate from South Africa. Mm-hmm. You know, they've done, done their time in South Africa, which is a tough market, emigrated to Australia, bought their families here. One of them even did 14 days quarantine in an Adelaide hotel. To, with his family to come here and I wouldn't no one needs to do that and so really committed to the job they've just bought a fresh set of eyes and a fresh approach to how I think about things they've been wonderful sounding boards they've really brought some sort of stability to the fund but also that youth right there's aspects of technology I mean when I was growing up and you know, we thought a fax was you know some sort of new technology now i need people younger than me who truly understand how to communicate how the world works how supply chains work how everything works on a technological basis and they are generally younger than me so those guys and girls have brought real skill that i don't have and if, if, i haven't done much right but i've got one thing right was to get people around with you around you that are younger and and just more knowledgeable on how the world works today and they find you and then you work out that they're good people. And anyone who's prepared to move from another country to work with me is in. That's a proper commitment. And I, and I really think that's uh, something that we, we, I really, really admire. How do, you, how do you go then encouraging them to speak up to you when you come out with an idea and they don't agree? How can you be sure that they're going to speak up? Well, generally, the first response is we're not doing that. Which, uh, which is pretty much hits that on pretty much hits that on the head. I can probably uh, be criticised for having too many ideas. I'm a bit of an enthusiast, but that's why you need you need a process. You need checks and balances around you. You need to not go outside that process. That's one of the good things about fund management. You can't just go off on a tangent. But also sticking to a process stops. You know, obviously stops that. But look, really, we we run it you know, much more. You know, by committee. I might have have the final vote on what we do, if anything. But we all have to come around to the view that this is a good idea to do and how to size it in the portfolio. The other things that the experienced you know, portfolio managers bought from South Africa is, is actually how to construct a portfolio, how to manage risk. I had no, you know, no, no real experience in that about being a stockbroker. But well, how you size positions inside the fund and how you generate excellent returns with, or returns better than the market you know, without taking as much risk as the market or you know, risk-adjusted returns, as we call it, is really really important and not getting you know the downside capture of the market but then beating it on the upside so the, the people who have joined me really really brought that to the fund that that ability to construct a portfolio which is arguably more important than the stock picking like how do you size things how do you limit the you know the chances of permanent capital loss but also how do you get enough money into the good ideas that they're not just a, a, a small amount of the portfolio so there's lots of different ways that you know, we approach it, but it's just a discipline that it's not a dictatorship. I don't think you can run a fund like a dictatorship. That's probably not going to be enduring or be just the, the one personality in, in front of it. I think that it's really, really important to have a very diverse set of eyes, but inside a very strict process. Mm. Um, how do you incentivize the team? Like, How do you ensure that their incentive structure is tied to the, the client's end? Yeah. their incentive i guess matching probably the key question i think that's absolutely the key question in, in funds management how are our incentives aligned to the underlying client well the best way to do them is make them long-term incentives we want people to invest for us for 5 10 15 years hopefully we compound their capital and generate good returns but we don't want to if in any way have the investment team or myself aiming at short-term horizons for bonuses to pay mortgages like that so the best way to do it is to have ownership of the business equity in the management company and that's what the staff have and that's what the staff retain. So if we perform well for our underlying investors and we grow the fund or we generate performance fees or we grow assets under management, the profitability of that management company will increase and therefore the dividends that go to the staff will increase as well. So I think that is proper, proper alignment. So we try to really avoid short-term incentives and, and things like those because it, it, it can drive behaviour that is, is not in the best interests of the clients. So everything has to be long-term. We tell, we tell our investors we're long-term, we really are. And we must have a remuneration structure that reflects that and, and is aligned with it. And I think we've got to that. As a, as a small business, you can do that. As you get a bit bigger, it probably gets a little bit harder, but I think we've got the balance in that uh, pretty right at the moment. And it seems, and it, it also brings the, the, the excitement of ownership. People want to own something, Owen. 
You know, yeah, you want to say you yeah. own a bit of a business, you know, not just I work for AIM or I work with Charlie or whatever. No, I own a part of this. It changes the mindset, the ownership mindset and understanding how our business works makes you a better analyst of other businesses is my strong mm. view. Mm. I agree. I can go. Uh, a few years ago, I think it was a few years ago now, you transitioned to long only. We talked about sh- uh, short sided books in that last time. You mentioned just in the uh, a couple of responses ago that the, the the two senior analysts and PMs brought that kind of rigor around portfolio construction and not getting, I guess, all that downside capture, right? Protecting the fund on the downside. Mm-hmm. What were some of the, now that you can reflect on it, what were some of the key challenges of having run that short side of the book? Um, I guess the, answer, the, the question is, why did you go long only? Well, we looked back, I mean, it was early 2019 and we, we'd had a, you know, not a wonderful 2018. And we looked back and just basically looked about where do we make money and where do we not make money? What, because everything you do inside a portfolio is taking a risk. But it looked, it was to us, I, I'll go back on shorting. Let's just go to a very high level on shorting and why we don't do it anymore. And it's actually been possibly the best decision we made is to take shorting out mm-hmm. of the equation and concentrate on just owning great businesses around the world in a, in a concentrated portfolio. Think about shorting. The most you can make is 99%. The most you can lose is infinite. That, for a start, is a very, very bad risk-reward equation. And obviously, the other way around in equities, if you own Microsoft, you can lose 99%, you can make infinite in theory. The other thing is it's an expensive business. You've got to borrow the script. You've got to pay borrowing costs. You can pay dividend costs, buybacks, all sorts of things. It's an expensive business. The other side of things is it's not very few people, Owen, are good at it. It's a bit of a dark science. The biggest returns you get from shorting are in frauds or accounting or something that's fraudulent, not just betting against, say, an iron ore price for a short period of time. But the simple fact of the matter is we did not think it was protecting our portfolio for the downs- for the downside capture we had hoped. You mm. know, we were not, single stock shorts were not working to protect the longs in the portfolio. In fact, they were leading us to be probably a bit overconfident because when you've got shorts on, you take mm. slightly lot bigger bets on the long side and you get a bit overconfident, but it is not guaranteed that the shorts will go down and the longs will go up. In fact, vice versa can actually happen. But the other thing worth taking into account is that there was some big changes happening. Now, in my previous life, I wrote notes and about shares and things, and you could see that there was a a bit of a growing audience for individual investors to make their own decisions, a bit like this podcast, you're informing mm. people about things that they act on eventually. But I could see that it was like an individual army growing. And when you have an individual army growing of individual investors, you need to be very, very careful on the short side because they can get very excited and take a stock to any price. It doesn't really <laughs> matter. There's no limit on what mm. the price is be. And as you've seen recently with the MEM stocks and Reddit uh, type, type mm. events in America, that, is, that has come, you know, come through you know, very clearly that there is, you, you've got to be very, very careful fighting that army or pick your fights. The other thing is, I don't want to fight with the Fed and ultra low interest rates. I don't want to fight with the M&A cycle. Some of the companies you want to short get taken over. That's a disaster, obviously, because someone thinks they can run them better. You're also pa- fighting passive flows and ETF flows. And basically, Owen, you're in a fight against everything at the moment. And I don't think that's where you will get the best risk-adjusted returns. Now, I think there's a temptation to do shorting because it sounds smart and maybe you can charge higher fees as a fund manager because you do it. But I think it's the best decision we ever took was just to walk away from it because I truly believe it's poor risk reward in terms of allocation of capital. I think there are better ways of protecting a portfolio from permanent capital loss, which is by simply owning great businesses with great balance sheets that have great industry positioning, that have a huge free cash flow, but really no debt, great management they don't capture as much downside as others, or they probably very rarely capture permanent downside. Mm. And we just also came to the view that the, the better way to protect a global portfolio that we do is actually just to be unhedged to the Australian dollar. If the world goes to cactus, the Australian dollar goes down. If there's China sentiment the wrong way, the Australian dollar goes down. I don't want to be selling Microsoft for trying to time the market. Timing the market is, as you well know, is very, very hard and probably not going to add any mm. value to the portfolio. So there's better ways we think of protecting and protecting permanent capital loss via stock selection and process and unhedged Aussie dollar. And we just keep away from shorting because I think the risk reward is just not there. So one of the things that I, I know from studying fund managers is that those that use uh, options or shortings or any type of derivative instrument tend to pay away quite a bit. And so even in a, 
let's say a normal market 10 years ago, you wouldn't, that you were still swimming upstream, but it just probably wasn't as strong, the, the current, right, against you. But now, just based on what you've said there, it, it, it resonates with me because I see that a lot. The current seems to be getting stronger. And one of those ones is like tapering, um, which is a big, big thing too. Um, and since you've gone long only, the fund has actually performed very, very well. So, well, I think you know, the other thing is, Owen, like no offense to shorting, but I found it took up in a disproportionate amount of your headspace yeah. relative to the amount of money you had allocated to it. I mean, the reason for that is because you can lose so much. You know, you're, you're mm-hmm. constantly worrying about these positions that you don't really control. Where if we do bottom up research on a Microsoft or Nike or what, you know, whatever it is, you feel far more comfortable in your long term valuation or your investment thesis or the work that you've done and far more comfortable. So it becomes, you know, it's not just expensive. It's also how much effort you're putting in to generate whatever this, this small return or, or lowering of overall risk of the portfolio. Where I believe we're actually we're actually increasing the risk of the portfolio by by adding you know unlimited tail risk by these positions. So it's it's to me the returns of the fund in terms of risk adjusted returns and absolute returns and relative returns since we stopped do, doing it have never looked back. But you also just sleep better at night. You know, you've got a great portfolio. You're concentrating on making money, not trying to be sort of negative and, you know, hope something Mm. falls or hope something's a fraud or hope the world goes bad. You're concentrating on long-term proper compounding, bottom-up investing, thinking about also the top-down themes, where you want to be invested. And it just, it's a better use of your mind space. At the end of the day, we're not going to make our reputation you know, losing less than everyone else. Yes, there's periods like, you know, last year where we did lose less than everyone else, but it's what you do after that that matters. You know, mm. but there is no funds management game in being the guy who just loses less all the time, in, in my way of thinking. You know, markets do go up eight years out of 10. You know, so we, we want to be invested. The world's advancing. Interest rates are low. It's, it's a, there's a, you know, wonderful things happening in technology and development so quickly. It's a great time to be an investor. So I don't want to spend my time worrying about too much negativity or or, or, or those bets as well. Yeah, how did how did the investors take it? I imagine most like most fund managers probably would be pretty, you know, scared off of making a, a change like that. But you seem to have pulled it off. Well, I think investors. We explained to investors very clearly that it was actually adding adding risk to the portfolio and retract and detracting from our performance. So most understood that. But the generation of investor that invests with us is you know, a little bit generally a little bit older than me. And quite frankly, I mean, they don't like shorting. They don't understand why you're allowed to do it. You know, mm-hmm. you know they don't. Yeah, they don't that's really, true. I've actually heard really that. Like okay, you can't short my house. So how can you short BHP share, whatever it is? So look, oh, they don't really like it. Even even Dad, you know, said to me on that last trip. He said, "I'm I'm glad you gave up that shorting. I just don't like it." Now he was 85, but they just people. There's as I said, there's very few people who are very good at it, and I wish them well. I mean, there are some that are very good, and that's fantastic. But I'm just not sure that, you know, you need to do it. You know, we're hoping to buy great businesses and hold them for 5, 10, 15 years. And, you know, there will be market cycles and some things will be out of favour and in favour. But if you own great businesses, you'll see it through. Mm. And I just, the reaction was, I well, we, we saw no one redeem money on the idea, put it that way. You know, it was, it was just seen as a simplification. I think when investors and advisors see that you're simplifying your investment process, less moving parts, more conviction, more investment in the investment team, more analytical firepower, you know, really looking for ideas to make people money over the over the medium term. I think most people like seeing that, a simplification, because you simply can't be all things to all people or good at all things. Mm, that's fair. Um, one of the things that I wanted to pick your mind about because I know you have a lot of experience in this regard is basically what's going on in emerging markets, specifically in China, um, because I know you have that kind of that lens where you can look at those businesses, but also um, you've got that quality focus. And what we've seen from some of the big uh, tech companies in China in particular is we've seen some of that, I guess you wouldn't call it geopolitical risk, but maybe like regulatory governmental risk kind of come to the fore with some of these businesses uh, in so the last 18 months, probably starting with Jack Ma. Mm. And I'm just interested to to pick your brain on that. Just basically, are you surprised by the changes? How do you see what the current state of affairs? Well, thankfully, we're not surprised. We're actually very, we were very well positioned for that due to some changes we also made a few years ago. Also, the change in the investment team where the guys came from South Africa and said, you know what, 
you don't need to take direct emerging market risk. You don't need to own China to have exposure to China. And that was a really, really good call. Why do you need the volatility of this emerging market, you know, Shanghai, Hong Kong stuff that is super volatile, super day trader, and also has the unpredictable regulatory risk of the CCP in Beijing? You know, it, it, it's, it's, you're throwing all this into the mix and it trades like an emerging market. So if the US dollar is ever strong, people are just going to sell it. It's as simple as that. But they, you know, we, we are still you know, optimistic on the Chinese consumer and Asian consumer as a whole. So we want exposure to the region, but we just don't want much direct exposure. So we, we, you know, the, the guys who join the team have, a, have an approach called sort of geographic revenue split. So we can own a multinational company like you know, Nike, which I'll, which I'll get to later. Nike has 19% of its sales in China. It's listed in the United States, it's, but it has 26% of its profits in, out, of, um, out of China. So it obviously gets greater margins out of China than anywhere else, but it's not listed there. It's probably got pretty reasonably low uh, regulatory risk. It's a brand that's recognized in China. There's not much competition with it in China. Is something like a Nike or a Louis Vuitton, or even in an Australian context, a BHP listed in Sydney, a much better way of playing China than physically taking the volatility risk and absolutely unpredictable regulatory side that we've seen this year in China. So that approach has served us really well. We have around 15% of the fund gets its revenue from China, but we have 3% of the fund in physically Hong Kong just in one stock, Tencent, which we still think is investable. But thankfully, we've got, you know, I can credit my brother James, who's a world expert on macroeconomics, who, who warned us there was a big change happening in China, put us in touch with some really good on the ground contacts in China who, you know, made sure that we were very underexposed that we sold out of Alibaba about two years ago at a really good price. We kept a very small position in Tencent, which hasn't really hurt us and had nothing else and changed to owning, you know, Louis Vuitton, Estee Lauder. And Nike, I suppose, is our Chinese, bigger Chinese exposures, but all in other jurisdictions, which have been really, really good ideas. I think you need to be very, very careful up there, Owen. I think this is a big regime change. I think you, you want to be very careful sort of bottom fishing up there. I don't think anyone's got a clue what comes next. You know, big companies, it did start with Ant Financial and Jack Ma, you know, sticking his head up. And that's been very bad for Alibaba shareholders and probably continue to be. Tencent, we have a small position in about 3% of the fund. We still think that's you know, investable and has, has some upside, but we limit it to 3%, about 3% of the fund. But you won't see me and my team changing our ways on that. I think there's probably even bigger argument to having nothing in China and more Louis Vuittons, more Nikes, more Estee Lauders, and just playing it in other jurisdictions and staying way away from the direct equities. It is worth remembering with emerging markets, and I, I always say this to people in meetings I have, emerging markets are like, Perhaps like a girl you date but don't marry. You know, it's like they're fun, they're fun for a while. And I don't want everyone to take this the wrong way. They're fun for a while, but you want to get married to the Microsofts, the Nikes, the, the Louis Vuittons of the world, because the volatility in these emerging markets is just, it's not worth the risk. Do you need to be there to get access to the Chinese consumer? And don't get me wrong, I want access to the Chinese consumer. I just don't want to own Chinese equities. And you won't see us changing that. I think it's a really good. Um, initiative that the, the new members of the team brought in, and it's really, really served us well. And you can see that you know, our performance is you know, showing through nicely by making those, making those changes. Can I just ask, do you remember any of the anecdotes or um, kind of words of wisdom that were coming from those people who were on the ground two years ago in China? Yeah, well, it was really basically, basically about uh, President Xi really getting rid of any challenges and exerting his authority and he was coming for a more communal response from the rich, I suppose, was the, the idea. And then once we saw the Ant Financial move, where he kiboshed a global IPO, that was the, that was the absolute clearer sign. But this is, you know, to us, something like a, a, a cultural directive change that you just don't fight. Now, I don't know exactly where it ends, but we were warned that this is a proper change. It's not a slap on the wrist saying just pay a fine and you can go on with things. This is going to be a bit of a redistribution of wealth in terms from you know, highly profitable companies to back to the CCP. So if you think about highly profitable companies, in our models, we have to run basically a higher tax rate for Chinese companies. Now, mm. the biggest thing we've got to be concerned about that we're doing some work on now is this, does this spread to Western companies doing business in China? And that's where we would have to adjust our, our view if we, if we thought that like Nike or 
Estee Lauder or Louis Vuitton was going to be, you know, taxed even harder in China or have to pay part of this, you know, redistribution tax. But that hasn't happened yet. So we'll wait and see on that. But look, it, it, you know, if you think about it in an Australian context too, we don't do Australia own, but like you think about it, it's you know, barley, you know, lobsters, uh, premium wine, iron ore could be next. There's, there's, you know, there's all mm. sorts of things just being hit on, you know, the CCPs or Beijing's, you know, you know increasing aggression. So you need to be very, very selective in this space. And that's why we, you know, we have 77% of the fund in the United States. They're mostly multinational companies. So you're not hugely overweight, you know, American revenue. But I think that is the right positioning for the times. And you won't see us doing anything, you know, brave in China. Mm, this could be a multi-year event, Owen, I think. I think it's time to be very sensible. Yeah, right. Interesting. Um, okay. So I, I asked in, in anticipation for this conversation that you might share two ideas with us. Um, one of them I know absolutely nothing about. And the other one I know a bit about because I have some pants and a few jumpers ha. and some shoes in the other room, which is Nike or Nike. Um, t- tell us tell us a bit about why you like Nike and that business, other than say it's indirect exposure to a pretty high margin yeah, Chinese like, operation. But Nike's you know, obviously a business most people, are, most people know. I'd be surprised if most listeners don't have one piece of their apparel or a pair of shoes or own some of their time. I think... It captures two great themes, I think. Owen. One is the, the trend to athleisure wear, which uh, you mm. see I'm, wearing, I'm not actually wearing Nike shirt today, but it's like, you know, <laughs> the trend to athleisure wear is strong. Plus just health and fitness. Post the pandemic, I think health, health and fitness, people are going to spend more time on health, well-being, fitness. And I think Nike plays uh, beautifully into that. But it's not just the strength of the brand. That's probably its, you know, its moat is its brand. It's really, there's also a business transformation uh, story on here. Nike is trying to cut out the middleman. So instead of you and me going to the athlete's foot and taking our luck and finding a pair of size 11 runners, they're trying, they're Nike is trying to cut out that middleman and take us straight to Nike.com or one of their stores and sell us directly. Now, they're really getting somewhere with this because it's much, much higher margin if they can sell to us directly, directly consumer, than through a wholesaler. Plus, they can also control their inventory much better and know their customer much better. So I've done this a few times and got on Nike.com and ordered a pair of running shoes. I've customised them to the colours I like. I've got the right size. I can see them being made, where they're being made. I can track them. And they turn up at my house within about 12 days from where, in normal times in about 12 days. I pay about probably 50 bucks more than I would at, you know, the athlete's foot, but I get exactly what I want. I'm not taking pot luck at the store. Firstly, that someone will serve me. Secondly, that they've got the inventory. And I'm getting this bespoke sort of you know, uh, service from Nike. So first, it's a, it's a business transformation story. If they're currently 61% wholesale, i.e. through the, you know, the mm. through the channels that are talked about, and 39% direct. In that scenario, if they got to 50% wholesale, 50% direct, the margins double, the cash flow doubles, it just all comes back to shareholders. And that transition is underway. So we think we're in the early stages of business transformation tonight to more of an omni-channel retailer, which are the ones that get you know, very highly rated in the world. Challenge, it really doesn't have much challenge as a brand. I mean, some of the great upside also comes from women's wear. Women's wear and women's athletic wear and women's footwear only accounts for 23% of Nike sales. Hmm. So there's huge upside there. I think that obviously people like Lululemon have captured a bit of that market in the, in the yoga lardies wear or whatever you want to call it. But there's big upside for uh, in Nike there with women's uh, and women's and children, I would, I would say. And the other thing is, you want to just think about the strength of the brand. You and I are old enough to remember Michael Jordan. Now he hasn't played for twenty odd years. The mm. brand Jordan inside Nike contributes thirteen percent of all revenues. Thirteen percent comes from the brand Jordan. He, I'll say that again. He hasn't played for over twenty years. Mm. And that just shows you how good some of their brands are, how spot how spot on some of their marketing is. And there's, there's a bit of brand loyalty. And obviously some of those sneakers even trade, you know, more expensively in secondary markets. So for mm. me, it's a classic story that represents about 5% of our fund, top-down drivers of athleisure wear and health and wellness, great brand, business transformation story as well, big opportunity with women and children, and still some wonderful legacy brands and very diverse around the world. It's, you know, about 40% of its revenue comes from North America, as I said, about 20% from China. It's quite diverse in where, where it comes from. But just a great business and look really, really starting to be more shareholder friendly in disclosure, cash flow, you know, and, and buybacks, et cetera. So I think that's a, a big investment for us. It's been a really good investment for us. I don't think it's one of those just, you know, once off stay at home COVID winners. I mean, to me, that's possibly something like a Peloton, which I'm not sure everyone's going to be riding a bike in the garage for the rest of their life. You know, this is, this is 
you know, clothes and at, at leisure wear you can wear and footwear you can wear outside as well. So Nike, I think, is a, going to be a great medium-term investment. I think there's a lot more to come there. And I think that, you know, we'll, you'll, we'll hear us talking about that for some time, I think. Huh? Mm. Just one thing on that. Um, one of the things, um, I, I could be mistaken, but um, did, they, did Nike move their manufacturing out of China um, a while back? I, I, I could be wrong. They've done a bit of that. They've, they've tried to obviously wake up to the ESG issue of, you know, cheap labour, yeah. you know, not paying people properly, where you source the cotton from. They did make one comment the other day to the IRA of Beijing about the uh, uh, cotton, which wasn't well taken, but there was no real sanctions put on Nike for that in China. There was a bit of a social media backlash, which lasted a couple of days. But, uh, but uh, they've been aware of moving their manufacturing base, but it's still there still is a fair bit of manufacturing in Asia. But, I mean, that is where they are close to the market. It's not um, not easy to totally uproot, but I think they're, they're they're moving on, at least aware of the wages they pay and where they're sourcing um, sourcing goods and supply chain. That's another thing they've invested in heavily is supply chain, RFID tagging, knowing where the inventory is, not having big inventory cycles. This is a really, really well-run business, pardon the pun. <laughs> you know, just, but you've used that one a few times. <laughs> I haven't. I actually, just, I actually haven't. It just came out there. <laughs> The other business which the other the other business which I know very little about is um, a company called Heiko. Yeah. Is that how you pronounce it? Heiko, yeah. Yeah. I I until I found out we're going to be talking about it, I had no idea what it does. Um so maybe you can start at the top. Yeah, well, that's where we're a little bit different, Owen, because we're you know, a boutique global investor. We can own mega caps like Nike and Microsoft, but we also go down the market cap food chain, but we'd never go away from the quality of the business. There are some great, great mid cap and small cap businesses where you're not sacrificing quality. You're buying wonderful management, wonderful industry position, wonderful long-term returns, potentially great you know, future returns, but you're not sacrificing quality. So we don't, we have the ability to go down the market cap food chain and high case, I would probably describe as a mid cap industrial company, but it's a great industrial company. Now it sounds pretty boring. It, it supplies, you know, airline replacement parts. You know, basically, basically little widgets for toilet doors in air, in, in aeroplanes, lighting, those little tray table, you know, you know mm. holders you have and things like that, brakes, you know, wheels, everything you can think of. So they supply parts to the aviation, the aviation industry, but they supply them at 50% cheaper than the OEM model. So if you go to buy the part from Airbus or, or Boeing, it's about 50, 50, you know, 50% more, et cetera, et cetera. So they've got a great business in secondhand parts. And I suppose that the moat here is, you'd probably say to me, like, what on earth is the attraction of this business? Well, the moat is that every one of these parts and every one of these suppliers like Heiko needs to be FAA approved. And Heiko has an impeccable safety record, 30 years without an incident involving one of their parts, which is exceptional. So they've also, they've been gaining market share in periods like this when other suppliers, you know, have other leveraged suppliers have, have issues. But they've also been run really well by a family called Mendelssohn, who bought the basically, you know, majority owned the stock for 30 years. They have delivered a 15% compound average revenue growth for 30 years. And the stock has beaten the S&P 500 by 33 times over that period, just compounding away, taking a little mm -hmm. bit of market share, managing the margin. But we've added to it recently because the history suggests that in periods where the aviation sector is under pressure, such as right now, they will consolidate the industry a little bit, take more market share, then emerge with a bit of pricing power into a bigger market. There's no doubt we're you know, obviously closer to the end of the pandemic and the end of the you know, restrictions on international travel. One of the things holding the share price at the moment back is international travel is obviously restricted, but domestic travel in America is almost back to, back to normal. Once we see those planes come out of the desert, new parts being needed, et cetera, et cetera, I think Heiko is going to do really well. But it's it's not a complicated business, Owen. It's a great business that does the same thing day in, day out. It's got a, it's in an oligopoly. It's got huge barriers to entry in terms of F, 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 FAA, F Federal Aviation Authority certification. Mm -hmm. And it's just generating great long-term margins and a really, really well-run business. So there's nothing, there's not, it's not rocket science. It's just a really good industrial business. And we use it in the portfolio as, dare I say, a reopening trade, if you want to call it that. You know, to have a bit of diversity in there and it's something that's really leveraged the world normalising and aviation normalising. And I strongly believe aviation will normalise with vaccine passports and you know, business travel. I don't think forecasts of people not travelling for business again and everyone doing Zoom again are absolutely accurate. 
And I think that we've got a wonderful business here that you know will emerge out of this with great leverage to the recovery. So simple business, airline parts, extremely well run, great balance sheet, great operating margins, but just keeps those planes in the air. And I'd much rather own it than an airline or an airport. Mm. Just maybe one kind of follow-up here on these both these companies, which is that how do you think about portfolio management in terms of constructing that portfolio? Um, are there certain metrics or things that you would think about from a, like a high level? Do you add any sort of like, I guess, structure or quantitative metrics around position sizing? Yeah, absolutely. The biggest investment we will make individually is 7.5% of the fund. The smallest investment will be 2.5% of the fund. The biggest sector limit is in GICs. Sector limit is 30%. We're currently about 28% in IT. Mm. And that's really uh, that's really how, how we limit it. So nothing above uh, nothing above 30% in one individual sector, nothing above 7.5% in one individual stock. We try to run concentrated to 15 to 25 stocks, not have a long tail. I, I just think the longer you get in the tail, you can get into diversification. You're sort of di- diversifying, but you're not increasing the return. Mm. You're actually reducing the return. So we run it concentrated. We feel comfortable running it concentrated because we're owning these great businesses. And the best thing that happened to us in the, in the whole COVID meltdown is we owned businesses that had impeccable balance sheets. They were going to be in business no matter what happened. You know, if this had gone on for two or three or four years, our businesses would have been in business. And they probably would have consolidated their industries. It's probably a slight shame that it didn't last a little bit longer for some of these businesses so they could buy out some weaker competitors. But, you know, to me, the limits are very important because, you know, it's so easy to cheerlead one of your winners, but we've been consistently trimming Microsoft, our biggest investment, for about three years now because it keeps breaching our 7.5% limit. But it's a good discipline to have. It takes emotion out of it. It doesn't reduce return. And it makes you not become a, you know, a one-trick pony because, quite frankly, Owen, I don't know what comes next. I don't want to be betting one way on one thing, whether it's interest rates or vaccines or behaviour, I want a diversified portfolio of great businesses that can do their own thing and also sort of negate each other in, in moments of moments of volatility. So yes, we have very strict limits on what we do inside the portfolio and, and stick to them. And I think it's important for all investors to have some sort of limitation on what they do and, and some sort of, uh, you know, some sort of rules around how they run a portfolio. For sure. For sure it is. Um, mate, this brings us to the end of the conversation which is it was great to catch up. But if people wanted to read the monthlies or learn more about what you're doing, where would they go to find out more? Yeah, they just go to our website, www.aimfunds.com.au or they can email me directly, ca at aimfunds.com.au. You, you can still email me directly. It's, um, we're not that big. <laughs> That's dangerous, mate. You oh, get a few I love the conversation. I mean, it's, it's wonderful. I mean, investing is a wonderful thing. People are interested in investments. Guys doing a great job like you are and helping people get access to people and ideas. It's great. You know, like no, no problem with anyone emailing me. Like that's, it's, you know, I'm not that busy. You know, like, <laughs> we, we, I got great people around me. I'm sitting here at home. I just had to move the Labrador out. So I did bark. You know, we don't do much with a portfolio. We try to own great businesses and own them for as long as we can. The greatest advantage, if I'm going to end on this, if it's okay, the greatest advantage any investor has is time. It's time. Mm-hmm. They'll stay in the best businesses you can for as long as you can. I know it sounds corny, but it works. And so, you know, if anyone wants to get in contact with us, we're, we're very available. Cool. Wonderful, mate. I like it. Good way to end. Cool. Thanks, Owen. Thanks for your time.